here in the faculty. You will enjoy this. If you have questions, please put them in this file, questions and answers, not in the chat uh, box, which is actually limited only for the faculty. <clears throat> One more point. Uh, after the webinar, you'll get information with a uh, with a evaluation sheet. And if you send that back, you will get your CME points for this webinar. But you have to do that in between the first week. Otherwise, we are not able to do that anymore. It's a very short sheet you have to fill out, which will cost you a few seconds only. Well, we have some great announcements later on. So it would be nice if you could stay for the whole time. Actually, ISG is planning the next uh, international symposium on uveitis in August in Netherlands. And we are opening now our abstract submission files and more about this one later. And I think Vishali will guide you through the program. Thank you, Manfred, and welcome everyone once again. We, you guys have become like a family, meeting all of us every month, and it's a sheer pleasure. And it's my honor to invite a wonderful panel of speakers today. And uh, as Manfred said, kids pose a lot of problem, and I'm personally looking forward to learning from all the speakers today. So we start with Dr. Sudha Ganesh. Uh, she is going to talk about differential diagnosis of pediatric uveitis. Over to you, Sudha, and you may start sharing the screen. Uh, Sudha? Yeah, she's, uh, Dr. Sudha, you are muted. Can you unmute? Yeah, perfect. You can hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Just go on. All good. I wish to thank Dr. Vishali for the introduction and the IUSG for inviting me here for this uh, wonderful symposium. And my talk today is on pediatric uveitis, the differential diagnosis. For some reason, my slide's not moving. Sorry about that. So pediatric uveitis is a topic of special interest because of the unique diagnostic challenges. And often children are discovered as a part, uveitis in children is discovered as a part of the routine eye examination. The inflammation is usually silent and insidious and leads to complications if it's not handled skillfully. Children make up 2.2 to 13.8% of patients in the uveitis clinics, and the pediatric uveitis is a potentially blinding condition with a high rate of complications and vision loss as compared to adults. The diagnosis of pediatric uveitis requires a good history, a thorough review of systems, and a complete examination, and a focused laboratory workup. The treatment options and escalations are similar to adults, except that the long-term oral corticosteroid is not recommended in children. Complications like amblyopia can be devastating in the pediatric population and may result in severe vision loss in 25 to 30% of the pediatric patients. The challenge with children is that to evaluate the child with uveitis, a complete ophthalmic examination is required. Children do not report problems at the initial onset and present only after the vision loss has occurred. At times with very young children, an examination under anesthesia may be required, especially if additional testing like an FFA is required. The previous infectious exposures with pets, travel, should be elicited and the history taking as well as the review of systems may be difficult because the ophthalmologist has to rely on the parents for most of the information. Coming to the differential diagnosis, the classification starts by determining the anatomic location. Smith et al. showed the breakdown of the pediatric uveitis anatomically as 30 to 40 percent anterior uveitis, 40 to 50 posterior, 10 to 20 intermediate, and 5 to 10 percent pan uveitis with a slight female preponderance. The other way of classifying would be infectious versus non infectious. And in the pediatric population, it is also helpful to note during classification whether the child child is in infancy, that is 0 to 2 years, toddler or school age 2 to 10 years, or whether the child is an adolescent between 10 to 20 years. 
Now, coming to the differential diagnosis per se, the children can generally be identified as having one of the following causes, either it's an infectious uveitis, a non-infectious uveitis, or a masquerade syndrome. The clinical and laboratory investigations are done based on a detailed family and past medical history, age of the child, anatomic location of the inflammation, and type of inflammation, whether it's granulomatous or non-granulomatous. The table of the etiologies, generally it falls into these three categories. Infectious could be either toxoplasmosis, toxocariasis, the herpetic infections, HIV, rubella, EBV, syphilis, TB or Lyme. And the non-infectious is often either a GIA, Blau syndrome, Tino, sarcoidosis, Bessette's, pasplanitis, VKH or sympathetic ophthalmia, which will be all covered in detail by the subsequent speakers. And the third group is a masquerade, which could be either a leukemia, retinoblastoma, juvenile xanthogranuloma or a trauma. GIA being the most common of the pediatric infections has been discovered extensively in the previous webinars and will, I will not go into it in detail. Tino can be autoimmune, can be estimated to account for 1-2% to of all uveitis seen in referral centers. Diagnosis is based on the concurrence of an acute tubular interstitial nephritis and anterior uveitis. The uveitis may precede or succeed the renal disease and a renal biopsy may be required for a, a confirmatory diagnosis. Juvenile sarcoidosis is rare and older children may have a pulmonary involvement, whereas younger children often present with arthritis or skin lesions and uveitis. Juvenile sarcoidosis and Blau syndrome can present with a granulomatous ocular inflammation and posterior segment involvement. The posterior segment involvement is often atypical in GIA-related uveitis. Uveitis develops in 60 to 80% of patients with Blau at about four years of age, and a family history reveals that most of them will have a familial juvenile granulomatosis. These are some of the pictures of a granulomatous panuveitis. Coming to past planitis, an intermediate uveitis with snowbank or snowball formation in the absence of associated infection or systemic disease, usually presents with past planitis. The children have blurry vision and floaters. Symptoms like redness or painful eyes often absent. And these are some of the pictures of an intermediate uveitis or a past planitis. Coming to Bechet's disease, there are no internationally accepted diagnostic criteria for childhood onset Bechet's disease. A recent inter international registry of patients suspected of Bechet's disease uh, found that the isolated symptom of recurrent oral ulcers in 83% of the children, and this diagnosis was confirmed by an expert committee. Childhood onset Bechet's disease, uh, uveitis, is more common among males, and most of them present with bilateral pan uveitis with retinal vasculitis and retinitis being more very frequent. Coming to VKH as one of the non-infectious causes, VKH is a rare systemic autoimmune disease. It's presence as a bilateral granulomatous panuveitis as in adults and may be accompanied by neurologic, auditory or integumentary symptoms. It's VKH in children is more aggressive than in adults. The estimated prevalence of pediatric VKH is between 1 to 15 percent. This is a four-year-old boy with VKH which we had seen at our clinic. Sympathetic ophthalmia, again, another non-infectious cause is rare, is similar to VKH. It often has presence with a diffuse granulomatous panuveitis occurring after penetrating injury to one eye or multiple vitroretinal surgery. This was again, again another child in our clinic who presented with a sympathetic ophthalmitis. Coming to the acute features of both sympathetic ophthalmia and VKH, they present with pinhead leaks and uh, pooling in, on the FFA. And on the OCT, they show irregular bumpy RPE with increased coronary thickness. Whereas the chronic phases of both the diseases, the presence with depigmented retina, peripapillary atrophy, sometimes subretinal fibrosis or an optic nerve head neovascularization. Coming to the infectious causes, the infectious causes in uh, children account for 6 to 33 percent of all pediatric uveitis and can be caused by reactivation of a congenital infection or an acquired infection. There is a predominance of infectious uveitis in developing countries. In contrast, in developed nations, most of the uveitis related blindness is non infectious. So it's very important to distinguish between infectious and non infectious pediatric uveitis as the treatment pathways are totally different. Coming to the infectious uveitis encountered in the developing countries include infestations like toxoplasmosis, toxocariasis, cysticercosis, bacterial infections like uh, tuberculosis, leptospirosis, and herpetic infections. Ocular toxoplasmosis and herpetic infections are very common in infectious as infectious uveitis in developed countries. Whereas uveitis associated with dengue has been reported as the third common form of infectious uveitis in a study from Singapore. 
the prevalence of certain infectious etiologies in specific geographic regions may vary due to circulating endemic genotypes and the socioeconomic and the lifestyle habits. Coming to the other most common infectious cause seen in our country, India, ocular TB accounts for 4.9 to 7.4% of all pediatric cases. The pediatric TBU clinically manifests similar to adults with posterior uveitis and choroidal involvement. The COD study found the pediatric TBU was bilateral in 62% of patients. Posterior uveitis was common at, at around 50%, followed by pan uveitis 20, 21%, anterior uveitis 14.3%, and intermediate uveitis around 10%. Amongst the pediatric TBU, choroiditis was the most common. Choroiditis was the most common at around 64.7%, followed by disc edema 44%, macular edema 27.8%, retinal vasculitis in 21%. And amongst the choroiditis, the COD study found that the serpiginous like phenotype was most common, followed by APMPP, ampigenous, and the tuberculomas. These are some of the phenotypes that we do see in children being the choroiditis. In, amongst the choroiditis, the serpiginous like choroiditis being the most common. And then the optic nerve head involvement, sometimes macular edema retinal vasculitis and a tuberculoma. This is one of uh, two children seen at our hospital who presented with a mass in the anterior chamber and the AC tap of both the masses were found to be positive for TB and both of them resolved well with ATT and steroids. Other pediatric causes, toxoplasmosis is the most common infectious cause of uveitis in the pediatric population of developed countries occurring in about 60%. And the unmistakable punched out choroidal scar or the wagon wheel scar of congenital toxoplasmosis is a very uh, easy clinical diagnosis. The acquired toxoplasmosis could be found in slightly older children. Sometimes they present with a classic headlight and fog appearance, whereas sometimes they do have a reactivation of an old infection. Uh, you see a heel toxoplasmic scar with well-defined border with a choroidal atrophy and the reactivations often occur very close to the old scar and occasionally one sees the chiralis arthritis. This is coming to toxocariasis, it's unilateral in 90% of the cases. The clinical presentation of toxocariasis, it can be either a peripheral granuloma that you see here, which is the most common, or it could be a posterior pole granuloma that was seen in one of our patients. Uh, and most of the time, it, sometimes it can be an endophthalmitis-like picture as well. The inflammation in the peripheral retina and the ciliary body can mimic a pasplanitis or a retinitis. The retinal folds can be seen radiating and extending from the peripheral mass to the other areas of the fundus. Coming to the trematode like uveitis was found very common in uh, South India, especially reported by Dr. Uh, Rathinam et al. Children bathing in a pond in South India developed granulomatous anterior uveitis with anterior chamber nodules and subconjunctival nodules. The aspirates of the anterior chamber lesions reveal lymphocytes and uh, neutrophils and eosinophils, whereas one subconjunctival nodule showed a necrotizing granuloma which displayed the tegument of a trematode. Coming to cysticercus, cysticercus is very common in our part of the world, and it is uh, endemic in some parts of South America, Af Africa, Asia, and in India. So cysticercus can present as an intraocular cysticercus, cysticercus, and the anterior segment, it can be subretinal, it can be in the vitreous cavity or in the anterior chamber. And extraocular cysticercus can present mostly in the ocular muscles, most commonly in the medial rectus. In children, neurocysticercus is very common and one needs to definitely look for it. And this is a picture of a subretinal cysticercus in one of our older uh, children presented with uh, subretinal cysts, which was picked up on ultrasound. And the child also had uh, MRI lesion with neurocysticercus. Coming to VZV, HSV and the other viral infections, the clinical presentations are very similar to the adults. Children can present with a focal well-demarcated area of retinal necrosis in the peripheral retina with a rapid circumferential spread. They present with anterior chamber inflammation, vitreous inflammation and occlusive vasculopathies. And the immunocompromised can present with CMV retinitis as well. The acute retinal necrosis, according to the AUS uh, criteria can be discrete areas of retinitis and 1B being the confluent area of retinitis, then stage of vitreous opacification, stage 3 being the regression of the acute retinal necrosis, and the stage 4 where the regmatogenous retinal detachments occur. And ARN has been reported in children as young as 3 years. CMV retinitis often presents with a yellow white area of retinal necrosis with a dry granular border with a hemorrhagic presentation and more common in immunocompromised children. 
Coming to the masquerade syndromes like leukemia, retinoblastoma, juvenile xanthogranuloma, they can resemble an intraocular inflammation. They should be considered in children with uveitis, especially those that fail to respond to anti-inflammatory therapy. Leukemias are the most common, account for 31% of all malignancies in children below 15 years. The children can have unilateral or bilateral symptoms like a conjunctival injection, iridocyclitis, or the presentation can be a pseudohypopion or a spontaneous high femur. This was a patient with acute myeloid leukemia presenting with a hypopion uveitis. Leukemia can also present with a posterior uveitis with multiple flame-shaped hemorrhages with white centers and retinal infiltrates. Retinoblastoma is another common primary cancer that affects eyes in children. Uh, the, about 250 to 300 cases being reported in the United States. These children can present either with a true inflammation secondary to tumor necrosis or the tumor cells being mistaken for inflammatory cells. A case series reported by Stafford et al. showed that nearly 40% of patients with retinoblastoma were initially misdiagnosed as having uveitis. This was an 11-year-old girl who presented a decrease in vision of the right eye for one month with leukocoria. Posterior segment in, uh, revealed uh, numerous white snowballs and evaluation revealed retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma can also present with pseudohypopion with iris infiltrates. This was a child seen in our clinic with uh, blurring of vision, 11-year-old, plenty of witch cells. We found symmetrical white deposits in the cyberhyloid location with glistening deposits and further investigation and diagnostic vitrectomy revealed retinoblastoma. Juvenile xanthogranuloma is a non-neoplastic histocytic proliferation seen in younger children younger than two years. It's predominantly a skin disorder characterized by multiple yellowish or skin lesions. The children may have heterochromia localized or diffuse yellow creamy white iris lesions. They may present with spontaneous high femur glaucoma or anterior uveitis. Traumatic uveitis may be another differential. It can occur after blunt trauma. Severe inflammation after a minor trauma may signal the presence of underlying predisposition like a HLA-B27 disease. A study by Rosenbaum analyzed 496 patients with pediatric uveitis, and they found that non-penetrating trauma in initiating uveitis, 4.8% of patients suspected that their intraocular inflammation was related to the non-penetrating trauma. When do we label uveitis as idiopathic when no systemic cause is found? Multicenter study by Smith et al. of 527 patients found 28.8% of their patients had idiopathic uveitis. Benezra analyzed 821 children found 25.4% having uh, idiopathic disease. So idiopathic uveitis should be considered only when all other causes of uveitis have been ruled out. Last but not the least, Post-COVID uveitis, we have had two children aged 7 and 12 years presented with a bilateral pan-uveitis three weeks following an RT-PCR positive COVID infection. This is a picture of one child, both right and left eye having uh, anterior uveitis. The right and left eye were having an acute pan-uveitis vitritis, which resolved with the treatment. The treatment was similar to any other form of uveitis with topical and systemic steroids. So in conclusion, the diagnosis of pediat pediatric uveitis, one can look at it as uveitis, classify it as anterior, intermediate, pan-uveitis, or posterior uveitis. The anterior can be further subclassified as granulomatous or non-granulomatous, whereas the posterior can be divided as that with and without vasculitis. So the non-granulomatous, you could have a list of differentials here. Uh, I'm not going to read out everything because the subsequent speakers are going to cover all these topics. And when it's granulomatous, one may look at these differentials as well. When it's intermediate uveitis, one may look into these differentials, a pan-uveitis, a different set of differentials. And when you have posterior uveitis with vasculitis and without vasculitis, you have a different set of differentials would be very useful in uh, making a differential diagnosis of the case that we are dealing with. Age should also be looked into, especially in children who have intermediate and posterior uveitis. When you have a child between 0 to 2 years, think of toxoplasma, HSV retinitis, retinoblastoma, rubella, congenital syphilis, or a lymphocytic choreomeningitis. You have an age of child between 2 to 10 years. Again, think of toxoplasma, toxocera, leukemia, GIA, cat scratch disease, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, then the Sinca and the Norbit syndromes or the Blau syndrome. When you have children between 10 to 20 years of age, again, you could think of GIA, past planitis, HLA-B27 disease, APMP, P, POHS, DOSN, or leukemia. And children of any age, these would be the differentials, looking at HIV, CMV, ARN, endophthalmitis, Lyme, TNU, sarcoid TB, or VKH. So one proceeds based on the history that is elicited and the labs. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sudha. That was a very nice overview of overall what can happen 
and what can be the differentials for children. Thank you very much. Thank you. With this, we move on to our second topic, which is actually a very interesting topic because I personally feel I had been missing a lot of these cases when I was not looking for them. So we have now Maria Pia Paroli, and she'll be speaking to us about tubular interstitial nephritis and tubulitis. Over to you, Maria. Okay. <clears throat> Can you please go to slideshow, Maria? Oh, yes, just a minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Okay. Uh, thanks to, thanks Bishali, uh, Manfred and Mark for the kind invitation to talk about a syndrome characterized by the association of tubular interstitial nephritis and uveitis. I have no financial interests or relationships to disclose. It is an uncommon entity that was first described by Dobrin in 1975, but the acronym STINO was introduced 10 years later. The diagnosis of TINU requires both tubular interstitial nephritis and uveitis without the presence of other known systemic diseases that can cause such a, an association. Although the etiology and pathogenesis are still unknown, a common autoimmune mechanism involving a common antigen in the kidney and inocular tissue can play a significant role. Uh, the, uh, both uh, cellular and uh, humoral uh, immunity seems to be involved in the development of the disease. And uh, uh, there is uh, uh, seems to be a strong association with uh, several uh, HLA antigens. And uh, moreover, uh, uh, some uh, few cases uh, of TINU has been reported after using drugs, uh, after infections, uh, and during several autoimmune disorders. TINU is both a pediatric and a nodal disease with uh, a median age of onset of 15 years seems to have a female predominance uh, more striking uh, in uh, old old uh, disease uh, with males having an early onset of disease. Uh, it accounts for about 5% of pediatric tubular interstitial nephritis and uh, from 0.2 to 2% of UAITs, uh, till 30% uh, of pediatric bilateral anterior UAITs uh, without known racial or, or ethnic uh, predilection. Um, diagnostic criteria for uh, tubular interstitial nephritis was defined by histopathologic diagnosis by renal biopsy consistent with uh, tubular interstitial nephritis or clinical diagnosis. Uh, clinical criteria uh, comprise general symptoms and uh, laboratory abnormalities in blood like uh, uh, rising creatinine and anemia and so on, and in urine like uh, uh, and uh, rising protein and uh, uh, in uh, a rise in beta-2 microglobulin. Uh, the rise of serum creatinine and the urinary beta-2 microglobulin uh, seems to be uh, a very sensitive, uh, simple uh, test for screening in uh, uh, TINU children. Uh, but a very recent uh, report um, is a, a stress the usefulness of uh, renal diffusion of magnetic uh, uh, resonance imaging for the early diagnosis of TINU in one child without uh, laboratory abnormalities in blood and in urine. So uh, 
the renal prognosis of TINU seems to be more favorable in children than in adults, but uh, in almost 50% of patients, uh, um, uh, and about uh, three years of follow-up, a poor renal outcome was found in children, as reported by Chevalier and colleagues. So the renal and intraocular symptoms have often an asynchronous presentation. In children, uveitis is diagnosed more frequently after tuber interstitial nephritis and as a chronic and more severe course than adults. The typical uveitis was anterior, non-granulomatous and bilateral but uh, other kind of uveitis uh, and uh, ocular posterior findings uh, was uh, reported up to 65% of cases, mainly using uh, imaging diagnostic tools. Uh, the typical uveitis, uh, uh, alongside uh, the clinical criteria for uh, tuber interstitial nephritis, uh, defines TINU in definite, probable, and possible, as reported by Mandeville in two and colleagues in 2001, but this uh, classification is still in use. Um, and these are uh, uh, our, uh, our patients, uh, uh, not so many, 1.3% uh, in uh, 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 in uh, pediatric UVI, of pediatric, all, all pediatric uveitis. Uh, the most frequent uh, form was anterior in 50% of cases, uh, followed uh, in a fair percentage uh, by diffuse, intermediate, and posterior uveitis. And several posterior findings uh, was represented by vasculitis, optic nerve edema, and choroiditis. Uh, these uh, are the pictures by uh, uh, the younger patients of our Casius 3 uh, and uh, the fundus and uh, the OCT of a yuxta papillary lesion, uh, maybe an, a very old and fibrotic uh, CMV, we think, uh, after 25 years of follow up. Uh, prognosis uh, uh, was good in our patients uh, with a complete uh, recovery uh, after uh, uh, more than uh, one year, uh, less than two years of uh, follow-up. Um, about uh, the differential diagnosis uh, must uh, uh, be done with uh, all uh, uh, the uh, diseases that uh, has both uh, that have both uh, uveitis and uh, tuber interstitial nephritis, and with that diseases that can cause uh, chronic uveitis in childhood, like GIA. Sarcoidosis can be similar to Tino syndrome. Uh, kidney involvement uh, is less frequent, uh, but uh, we have a, a usually a granulomatous uh, interstitial nephritis, uh, and there is an elevated urinary beta-2 microglobulin level. So in, in uh, very uh, challenging ca cases uh, with uh, granulomatous uveitis anterior, uh, uh, a kidney biopsy uh, can uh, be useful uh, for uh, the definite diagnosis uh, um, uh, between these two syndromes. And uh, uh, tuber interstitial nephritis uh, uh, may be self-limited, but uh, prompt initiation of systemic corticosteroids uh, reduce inter inter interstitial inflammation and subsequent fibrosis. Uh, uh, sometimes the onset of uveitis uh, may be masked by the high dose of corticosteroids used for nephritis. Uh, prognosis of uveitis in TINU seems to be good in most cases, uh, reaching a complete recovery, but in up to 80% of cases, systemic steroids uh, are necessary also in anterior uveitis uh, that is uh, uh, relapsing. Uh, in about uh, one quarter of cases, uh, relapses, uh, the uveitis relapses and became chronic, so requiring immunosuppressive drugs. Um, the, um, a, among uh, the, the different uh, drugs, uh, immunosuppressive drugs, uh, 
um, the, there is no one drug uh, more effective than the others, but uh, methotrexate generally is used as a, a drug of first choice, uh, uh, mainly in, uh, in childhood. Um, the use of biologics uh, has been reported only a few cases, mainly of posterior ovaitis or in, in uh, refractory cases. Uh, in conclusions, uh, um, uh, TINU uh, is uh, probably an underdiagnosed syndrome, and it accounts for some cases of idiopathic uveitis. So, uh, take home message for ophthalmologists. Uh, all children with idiopathic uveitis should be suspected and screened for anal involvement. And for nephrologists and pediatricians, all children with tubular interstitial nephritis should be evaluated per uveitis because it is often asymptomatic, mainly in children, and not always cause red eye. Thanks for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, I think there are quite a few questions for you already in Q&A, and I'm sure Manfred will take many more during discussion. So Maria, may I request you to please stop sharing? And with this, I would like to invite our next speaker, Stephen okay. Rao and Stefan is going to talk to you about intermediate uveitis in children. Over to you, Stefan. Yes, hello. Um, thanks both of you, Manfred and Vishali, for this nice invitation. I'm happy to be here once again. And um, I hope you can see my first screen and my first, um, first slide. All good. Okay, so my topic is intermediate uveitis in children. Um, I think we also have to go back to the sun classification of uveitis because especially intermediate uveitis is sometimes a little difficult to understand. Intermediate uveitis is um, an inflammation where the primary site is the vitreous, and this includes the pars plana infiltrates, posterior cyclitis, as well as hyalitis. The diagnostic term of pars planitis should be restricted only to those cases where there's snow banking or snowballs in the absence of an associated infection or underlying disease where the disease really is idiopathic. Now, if like in this image and on the lower right side, you have um, pars plana infiltrates in the context of an MS, you would call it intermediate uveitis. Um, and it's also important to look at the slit, slit lamp to really get a very important first impression of where the primary site of inflammation really is located. These are two images from the same eye at the same moment where you can see the infiltrate and the, um, the anterior, um, anterior chamber involvement with cells. But you see that when you focus to the, um, to the area behind the lens and the anterior um, vitreous, you can see all these infiltrates and the cellular infiltrates and see that the predominant site of inflammation here is the vitreous, and therefore this is a patient with uh, intermediate uveitis. Um, to make another point, which has been made already, and in reference to, to the talks about JIA-associated uveitis last month, I think it's really very, very important to, to, to make the distinction and differentiate the intermediate uveitis from anterior uveitis. And here you really have to do a very careful clinical investigation. Um, roughly one third of pediatric uveitis cases are intermediate uveitis. And um, what is also important is that there are different underlying diseases compared to anterior uveitis. Usually, usually the course is much milder than an anterior uveitis. And fortunately, as a consequence of this, many children do not need any treatment. So there's sometimes the impression with patients with intermediate uveitis that are probably a little overtreated. Now, um, if you look at the epidemi epidemiology of intermediate pediatric uveitis, um, 18 to 38% of children having uveitis in, in reality have an intermediate uveitis, at least in the Caucasian population. If you look at East Asia, the percentage is much, much less in the Philippines and Japan and Korea. Um, the range of age, usually three to 16 years old, where most patients um, um, showing up with intermediate uveitis in the clinics um, are the age of eight to 10 years. There are more boys affected than girls. And while bilateral disease is common, 
um, as you can see by the publications from Heinz and Navarrete, is that um, unilateral disease is not infrequent. Now, how do these children present? Well, they usually present with fairly poor visual acuity um, with a LOGMA of 0.4 to 0.5. In another publication in Germany, it was, um, it was a little better. And from India, we have, um, we have a publication that shows that most patients have a visual acuity of less than 6 18th. Why is this? It's because the diagnosis is delayed. And the reason for this delayed type of diagnosis is that this disease is painless. There are typical no signs of inflammation. There's no red eye, there are no sinicure. There are usually no changes in the cornea. <clears throat> And what has happens very often in children is there's a lack of, of an appreciation for poor vision. They just don't realize that the visual acuity is poor, not even in, if it's just in single-sided diseases. But with increasing demands for good visual acuity, even in small children and in kids is using tablets, smartphones, we might see um, that the Visual acuity at times of diagnosis might be a little better in the future. Let's see how this is going to develop. Um, this brings me to the point of complications of intermediate uveitis, because complications are really the direct cause of loss of visual acuity. And one of the most prominent um, complications is papilledema, uh, where the fluorescent angiogra angiography is most sensitive to detect papilledema. Um, all patients with cystoid macular edema had papilledema, at least this was in a German population and that had been published by Heinz. Um, in, an Indian, in an Indian report, um, um, they showed that there is no papilledema in their patients, but they saw a lot of periphlebitis. And this might be the cause, or the, the underlying reason for this might be that the different underlying causes and underlying diseases in these different populations. Now, cystoid macular edema occurs in up to half of the patients. Cataract and glaucoma is fortunately much less. Um, epiretinal membranes in the range of 3 to 16%, 18%, and vitro hemorrhages are fortunately pretty rare, pretty rare like exudative retinal detachment. Anterior segment complications are not so frequent, like band keratopathy, posterior zemichia, and anterior chamber cells and keratic precipitate, I personally regard as a spillover phenomenon from intermediate uveitis like band keratopathy and posterior synechia too. Um, um, in, an, in a publication from Israel, it was interesting to look at the complications and they correlated that with the existence of cystoid macular edema. So those eyes that had cystoid macular edema compared the eyes that never developed cystoid macular edema, complications were much more frequent than uh, in the eyes that had never developed cystoid macular edema. So this indicating more active disease. So cystoid macular edema really is an important predictor of more complications and poorer outcome. And this is also true for visual acuity. And they also showed that um, at onset, this is the black, uh, these are the black lines, that the visual acuity at onset and even with successful treatment was poorer compared to those eyes that had never developed cystoid macular edema. That's the gray line at the, and, and the lowest line here in this graph. So cystoid macular edema really is something to carefully look at. And how do we do it best? Of course, with OCT. And these are typical images. Um, OCT also is very helpful um, for the detection of, 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 of papillitis. If you don't want to go into fluorescent angiography, which I think is probably not a good idea, but at least for the follow-up um, of papillitis, the OCT may be very helpful. And you don't have to do fluorescence at, at, every, at any time. Fluorescent angiography really is very helpful in looking at the activity of the retina, looking at papillitis, cystoid macular edema, and looking for leakage. But the question really is, and these are two publications, I'll come, to, to the, to come back to that a little later. The question really is, what type of consequences do we draw when we see these images? I'll come to that, uh, that back a little later. Now, looking at underlying diseases for pediatric intermediate uveitis, most patients do not have um, an underlying disease, so it really is idiopathic. This was shown by publications from, 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 uh, from the Netherlands, from Germany. Um, here, sometimes we see patients with multiple sclerosis, and, 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 and then it is also important to look at JIA. Rarely, 
JIA may be an underlying cause of intermediate uveitis. This probably not always, it's not always on our screens, but I think we have to keep an eye on it. Um, publications from Lausanne in India have shown that there are, um, again, um, diff the different causes. So for the European population, the idiopathic disease is most frequent. Um, systemic disease, which un unfortunately in that paper from Lausanne was not further specified, occurred in up to 12%, and there are also some infectious causes. Um, in India, probably due to the, to, the, um, to the high prevalence of TB here, many patients with pediatric intermediate uveitis had an underlying tuberculous infections and that needed treatment. Um, sarcoidosis and Bechet's disease was much less. And here again, a patient popped up with, J, uh, with JIA and some of those patients, some, a fourth of those patients, five of these 20 publications were idiopathic. Um, this is another, this is another um, um, publication from Israel where they also have shown that many of patients were just isolated pars pl uh, planar infiltrates on idiopathic disease in the age group of up to 16 years. Sarcoidosis, not so frequent, and multiple sclerosis is pretty rare. Now, we've just talk, um, heard a talk about um, 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 Tino syndrome. And I think what we really have to consider is that Tino is not just an anterior uveitis and that probably it is much more frequent as an underlying cause in intermediate uveitis than, than we might have anticipated and appreciated in the last years. And um, I point here um, towards two publications for Pentinga and, and Soboleska who showed that in a significant number of pediatric uveitis, TINU or presumed TINU was the underlying cause. And they detected usually by urinary, urinary beta poop microglobulin, serum creatinine, and proteinuria. And many of these patients um, um, had an, from Utrecht had an intermediate uveitis, and there was also one with pan uveitis. And um, the, the group in Tübingen showed that uh, three of those nine patients also had an intermediate uveitis that was associated with Tino. So Tino is probably more frequent in, um, in intermediate uveitis than we have looked at it in the last years. Now, what do we do as a per workup for patients with pediatric, inter um, pediatric intermediate uveitis? Of course, imaging. But um, looking for, um, for systemic disease and underlying disorders, chest X-ray, electrolytes, um, serum creatinine, angiotensin converting enzyme or I2 receptors um, are important to rule out any um, um, underlying rheum rheumatologic disorders, anti-nuclear antibody and rheumatoid factor may be of importance. And I think here I have to add urinary beta to microglobulin and proteinuria to this list because again, Tino is probably overlooked in many cases. In countries where TB is a specific problem, here an interferon re gamma release assay should be done. Um, serology for Lyme disease probably has been a little overestimated in the last decades, but I think it's still worthwhile doing. Serology for syphilis, um, um, I hardly see any, um, any signs for it, but it's still in the recommendations to exclude congenital or even acquired syphilis, even in children, but I hope that's absolutely rare. The role of HIAB27 in intermediate uveitis, it has been mentioned in some publications. I think it's really not worth it because HIAB27 is purely associated with anterior uveitis, and in intermediate uveitis, you would just see the percentage of patients in, um, in your population, the frequency of HLEP27, but it's not really associated with intermediate uveitis. Now let's look at treatment in pediatric uveitis. Usually most recommend not to give any treatment. Um, I'll come, to uh, come back to that a little later and, um, and, and show you in which circumstances that might be a good idea not to treat. If you really have to treat as a kind of a stepladder approach, um, the first um, choice would be steroids, either regional or systemic. And if you see that there's a prolonged course of disease that requires treatment, or if you have you need high amounts of corticosteroids, then immunosuppressive treatment, either with conventional immunosuppressive treatments or biologicals would be a second choice. At any time, um, surgery might be required um, to, um, to control either proliferations with cryo or peripheral laser or to control um, opacities that just 
are not treatable with, with uh, me uh, medical treatment, like uh, doing the vitrectomy cataract surgery. In the rare cases, one has to do glauco um, glaucoma surgery. Um, um, from this publication from Hirsch, they showed that in almost 40 patients of corticosteroids who received parabarba intravitreal systemic steroids, they found that 20 of those 39 patients failed to control uveitis on steroid treatment. And of those 20, uh, these 20 patients, they switched to an immunosuppressive treatment and the first step to methotrexate, maximum at 25 mix per week. And they could show that 10 of the 20, um, 20 patients were successfully controlled with methotrexate, while the other 10 failed, either to intolerance or ineffectivity. And those in, a, in the second step were switched to mycophenolates or cyclosporin. And even if that was not working, the um, biologicals, either adalimumab or infliximab, was used in combination with a conventional immunosuppressive treatment to prevent the development of, of, of anti-TNF antibodies, anti-TNF anti inhibitor antibodies. And with this regimen of these 20 patients, 19 were completely tapered off steroids, and there was only one patient who uh, did not respond as effectively. Um, here again, looking at the development um, or in the treatment in patients with and without cystoid macular edema, this clearly indicates that patients with cystoid macular edema do, uh, macular edema do have a more severe cause of disease requiring more treatment um, and more combination treatment and more TNF blockers compared to those, um, those patients who had never developed cystoid macular edema. And in, in this publication, there were even um, almost half of the patients with outsystem macular edema that never received any systemic treatment or any treatment for the pediatric intermediate uveitis. So once again, cystoid macular edema here indicating two things. First, more um, 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 pressure on visual acuity, and second, more active disease. Um, Wenning from von Utrecht has published um, a group of seven patients where they used um, IL-6 receptor antagonist, in this case, topilizumab, um, after going through steroids, conventional and biological, um, biological um, treatment, um, immunosuppressive treatment. And their regimen was to use eight milligrams per kilo every four weeks. And they could see after six and 12 months, a reduction of cystoid macular edema, reduction of capillary leakage on fluorescein score and a visual an improvement in visual acuity. And down here, there are two images um, um, of a patient, the right and left eye before and after six months showing the significant improvement on um, fluorescein. Um, coming back to fluorescein, um, it, even in clinic acquired eyes, you can detect leakage and Here's a publication from Dallas showing these two images where, um, where they have, um, um, have um, done fluorescence in clinically quiet eyes and given them, depending on the activity on the, on the fluorescent angiography, have given systemic treatment could see a significant improvement in leakage. In 11 or 14 patients, and these are just two examples of, uh, examples of those. The question here really is, is this necessary? And I think we could probably discuss this a little later in the controversy, because in another publication from the Lausanne group, they showed that many patients who were on systemic treatment, and they could finally reduce the systemic treatment and continued only two of those six patients and added subtenostramcin alone to spare, to spare on systemic steroid and immunosuppressive treatment, and it ended up with, um, with good visual acuity, despite activity in the fluorescein score. So the question really comes up by an um, active um, fluorescein angiography um, showing leakage really is something that um, needs to be treated or not. My personal approach for the treatment in, in children is I try not to treat as long as there's no cystoid macular edema, as long as there's no, no or only mild papillitis and visual acuity remains fair. But you um, clearly have to watch for development of CME glaucoma cataract neovascularizations, which are fortunately pretty rare, pretty rare, at least in my hands. 
And in single, um, in, in, in single sided intermediate uveitis, also it's important to check for amblyopia because these are small kids and sometimes uh, um, and they are young and um, the visual acuity is not really stabilized. My first choice would then to go into corticosteroids as a topical or local treatment, parabarbar treatment. Systemic corticosteroids, of course, important if there are cystic macular edema and you have bilateral disease. And rarely we have to go into, um, into um, immunosuppressive treatment with methotrexate CYA, a TNF blocker. And um, ISX re uh, receptor antagonists I have used only in single cases. Unfortunately, I've not needed that too many of my patients. Surgery, you need, of course, for opacities in the vitreous, persistent hemorrhages, cataracts, and um, filtering, uh, filtrating surgery for, gloma, for glaucoma is fortunately pretty rare in children that is required, but in, in, in single cases, you really might need it. What I would recommend is prefer always filtrating surgery and avoid cyclic destruction because then you have to add more and more cyclic destruction and finally end up in, in a fitting eye. So just to summarize pediatric intermediate uveitis, um, it is, it is more frequently a cause, um, um, yeah, it's more frequently an atomic um, localization of, um, of, of uveitis in children than in adults. In adults, we have much more anterior uveitis. In children, we have, um, we have a significant proportion, up to 30%, um, showing up in intermediate uveitis. There are more boys affected than girls. The underlying disorders are very different and, and really very distinct compared to anterior uveitis. In general, we have a mitre cross and anterior uveitis, um, which gives us the opportunity in, in many cases not to treat. The preferential treatment is regional or systemic steroids and only in severe cases or prolonged extended course of disease, we need immunosuppressive treatment and surgery just as required. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And I'm sure you have given us quite a lot of material for discussion. I hope so. it, Yes. <laughs> Regarding not treating some of these children, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So let's go on to our next speaker, which is Sibyl Kadir Flar from Turkey. And she's going to be talking to us about posterior uveitis. Over to you, Sibyl. I think you can now see my slides. Yes, please go to slideshow. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do it. Now it's okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Manfred, Vishali, and Mark for uh, organizing such a nice meeting for every month. Uh, now we are doing the 15th and letting me the part of it in this pediatric uveitis session. I will talk about posterior uveitis in children. Uh, this have been also uh, summarized by Suda, therefore I am passing this slide. It's 5 to 10 percent of uveitis cases, and we have to differentiate infectious from non-infectious ones. Pediatric posterior uveitis uh, has an incidence of uh, 18 to 43 percent in different series, so it shows a regional distribution. From Turkey, we have a compiled uh, survey with uh, new cases, with a registry of new cases in 2008 and 2011. And 9% of the cases were less than 16 years of age. And uh, around 30% of these has poster had posterior or pan uveitis. Main causes after idiopathic ones were Bechet's disease in Turkey, toxoplasmosis, CMV retinitis, Vogt-Koenagi Harada disease, tuberculosis, and acute retinal necrosis and toxocariasis. Our institute uh, has uh, found 46 cases in this period, which has a higher uh, incidence like 18%, which is due to uh, a being a referral center for pediatric patients. We have a big pediatric hospital. And again, the most patients were uh, coming with Bechet's disease. 
Pediatric posterior uveitis has similar findings like adult posterior uveitis, the patients may come with vitritis, retinitis, vasculitis, choroiditis, optic disc edema, cystoid macular edema, neovascularization on disc or elsewhere, and serous retinal detachment. According to the etiology, we may divide it into three main groups as infectious cases, non-infectious cases and masquerades. Non-infectious cases may be with systemic diseases, most of uh, which will be covered by Lucia later, or without systemic diseases. Let's talk about chest disease first, as we see most of these cases in Turkey. Um, there's a consensus classification for Bechtet's pediatric Bechtet's disease. Three of these six items are necessary to classify a patient as having Bechtet's disease, pediatric Bechtet as recurrent of the ulcers, gentle ulceration, skin involvement, ocular involvement in the form of anterior uveitis, posterior uveitis or retinal vasculitis, neurological signs or vascular signs. In Turkey, in, according to different series, we have a uh, 9.5 to 16.5 percent of pediatric uveitis as Bechet's, and uveitis in pediatric Bechet's disease um, is seen in 27 to 80 percent of cases, most of which are pan uveitis and vasculitis. It's generally diagnosed around 13 years, though first symptom is seen around eight years, so there is a delay in diagnosis. The first manifestation is oral aftosis, and Different from adults, family history is positive in around 20% of cases, and again, there is male predominance. Again, we see vitritis in Bechtet's cases with pearl-like opacities after subsiding of vitritis. In retina, we can see vasculitis, vascular occlusions, edema, infiltrates, hemorrhages, cystoid macular edema, and finally, atrophy if not treated um, properly. An optic disc, we may see hyperemia, inflammation, disc edema, neovascularization, and atrophy. Let's talk about a case. Seven-year-old boy was presented with erythema nodosum for the last two, three months, oral FT for the last year, and arthralgia of knee for the last two weeks. The pathology test was positive. Ocular examination in 2007, Visual acuity was 0.3 bilaterally, and in the anterior chamber, there were one to two positive cells. But in the fundus, we see extensive vitreitis and diffuse vascular leakage, which necessitated systemic treatment. In seven years, the patient received nearly all the anti uh, immune suppressives necessary for Bechtet's disease, as ethiopian cyclosporin, interferon, IV, methylprednisolone, methotrexate, infliximab, and finally adalimumab. After seven years, he was in control with uh, 0.8 vision in the right eye and 0.63 uh, in the left, but there was posterior subcapsular cataract. Pediatric rheumatology department decided to uh, taper the adalimumab for a while, but the patient came a major flare up seen in the posterior with a pan uveitis. And we had to increase the dose. We had to give again IV methylprednisolone. And we are still following the patient. And after nearly 15 years, uh, right eye sees hand motions, uh, one po counts fingers from one meters, and by left eye sees 0.4. We are able to taper abadalimumab for the last two years uh, for with three week intervals, but we are still continuing this. So let's go to the infectious cases. We may not decide what will happen to what is happening with this eye, but if we look at the other eye, we have the clue. Ocular toxoplasmosis is the leading cause of posterior uveitis in children. It may be congenital or acquired, especially in endemic areas. It may be due to asymptomatic or subclinical infection uh, in acquired cases. Primary infection in pregnancy results in 40% congenital toxoplasmosis, but the severity of fetal damage is inversely related to pregnancy. What do we see in the back of the eye? We see retinochoroiditis mostly, 6 to 80% in congenital cases and up to 40% bilateral. These Congenital cases, even in treated ones for 
even one year, we may see recurrent ocular disease in up to 8%, 80% even after 10 years of age. Patients may come with focal necrotizing retinochoroiditis, especially with focal vitreitis, and we see retinal vasculitis, arteritis, or filobitis. They may be re near or removed from the inflammatory focus. Or, so if we see vasculitis in a child, we have to look for uh, all areas of the fundus for a uh, distant focus. There may be anterior uveitis with increased intraocular pressure, and we may see atypical forms in immunosuppressed patients. Diagnosis is clinical, it's the gold standard, but we may look for serum antibodies, and if we cannot decide, we may uh, look for aqueous humor antibodies and do the PCR test for toxoplasma DNA. Newborns, little children with active lesions, immune suppressed patients, and pregnant necessitate treatment. In elder children, large or multiple lesions, macular or optic nerve involvement, prominent vitreitis, or decreased visual acuity are the main indications for treatment. Prognosis is good in immune competent patients without macular involvement, but unilateral or bilateral blindness may be seen in 25% of the cases. Uh, we have just published the current practice in the management of ocular toxoplasmosis lately. In this study from Mexico, 56 eyes from 40 children were uh, studied. The bilaterally was 40%. Most cases were inactive at the time of the diagnosis, but uh, macular location was seen in 72%. In cases with retinal vasculitis, vasculitis was mostly away from the retinochoroiditis. There were complications like decreased visual acuity and strabismus due to macular involvement and delayed diagnosis, cataract, and retinal detachment. I have only seen one case, one child with retinal detachment due to toxoplasmosis, which was uh, surgically treated. Another, I would like to mention a case which we have seen in nine, uh, 2018, a nine-year-old girl with bilateral toxoplasmosis lesions, uh, with active lesions in the right-hand side and with uh, choroidal nerve vascularization active on the left-hand side with antituberculous therapy. In addition, we also gave uh, anti-VEGF injections to the left eye for two times. And in 2021, she was with 0.2 vision in the left eye and 0.5 vision in the right eye. Macular neovascularization is a common complication of toxoplasmosis, especially in children, and we may see the pitchfork sign in optic coherence tomography, and optic coherence tomography and geography is a helpful device, especially in children. Second parasite we see is toxocariasis, though not uh, seeing as previously. Ocular toxocariasis is seen in elder children without peripheral eosinophilia, they come with unilateral painless loss of vision, strabismus, and leukocoria. We may see peripheral granuloma, posterior pole granuloma, chronic endophthalmitis, tractional retinal detachment, or macular distortion. We have to differentiate these cases from the reasons of leukocoria, like retinoblastoma, infectious endophthalmitis, toxoplasmic retinochoroiditis, parsplenitis, retinopathy of prematurity, and Coats disease. Treatment is antihelminthics with corticosteroids and vitreoretinal surgery is done for complications. In literature, laser photocoagulation of live motile larvae has also been described. See herpetic cases more at our, immune, uh, uh, at our institute. CMV retinitis is generally seen in immune suppressed children, lymphoma, leukemia, patients receiving chemotherapy, transplant patients, and patients with AIDS. Congenital immune deficiencies, babies with congenital CMV infections, and after intravitreal corticosteroid injections due to local immune suppression, we may see cytomegalovirus retinitis. Classically, fulminant or peripheral granular type necrotizing retinitis are seen. They typically start at periphery and proceed to center. Rarely, peripherobitis in the form of frosted branches and giitis may be seen. The other findings may Retinal edema, occlusive vasculitis, perivascular sheathing, exudative retinal detachment, vitritis, anterior uveitis, and optic atrophy have also been described. 
Diagnosis is generally easy with typical clinical findings, but in immunosuppressed patients, sometimes they may be mistaken for other diseases and PCR may be necessary. For example, this case has been referred to us as the preliminary diagnosis of papilledema. He had hydrocephalus with a shunt and with the diagnosis of papilledema, the shunt has been changed one week ago. The other eye, when you look at the other eye, the other eye is typical for uh, CMV retinitis. However, we have to prove this. And we took a vitreous tap, which revealed cytomegalovirus retinitis, and with venous therapy, the patient obtained 0 0.2 vision in the end. CMV retinitis may cause lo visual loss due to absolute scotoma due to retinal necrosis. Macular involvement may end up in central scotoma. We may see optic nerve involvement and retinal detachment is seen in up to 50% of cases. QT medication here we give uh, induction therapy with generally as uh, intravenous, or sometimes with oral type, and sometimes we have to add uh, intravitreal therapy as well. For example, in this case with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the patient was seeing hand movements in the right eye, 0.8 in the left eye. We started intravenous therapy, but the patient didn't respond well in the right eye when we added intravitreal gancyclovir, and then the patient recovered to 0.5 vision in the right eye. ACM retinitis treatment may be necessary for a long time. Recurrences may be seen even under treatment. We may see immune recovery uveitis, and the visual loss is due to retinal necrosis, optic atrophy, or retinal detachment. Acute retinal necrosis is rare in children, but uh, described even in neonates. It may be due to varicella zoster or herpes simplex virus type 2. Generally, it's unilateral, with severe anterior uveitis and vitreitis. Occlusive retinal arteritis is the hallmark with progressive peripheral necrosis. The necrosis may end up in holes and retinal detachment. It may become bilateral in one third. Diagnosis, again, clinical and in suspected cases, PCR may be done. The treatment is with a cyclovir. Like a year old boy came with necrotizing retinitis, which coalesced and uh, responded well to treatment. However, later in the course, uh, he had retinal detachment, which was treated surgically. Sometimes patients may come this like this case. I think uh, Dr. Vishali Gupta has, uh, see, has shown a similar case in one month ago in a virtual uh, meeting. This granular type of appearance and irregular MP-like appearance, we have to look for OCT. And we we'll look at the OCT, we see moth eaten appearance in this child with subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is a long complication of measles, especially in unvaccinated children. Onset is generally in late childhood. Insidious onset may be seen with visual impairment. Behavioral disturbances, mental impairment, myoclonus, spastic paresis, dementia, and unfortunately death within one to two year, three years. Ocular findings may precede neurological manifestations by several weeks to two years in 10 to 15 percent. Therefore, we may be the first one seeing that patient. Maculopathy in the form of focal retinitis and RPE changes without vitritis is the typical finding. This is the first case I have seen in 1998, a five-year-old boy, uh, which <clears throat> the patient was uh, went and didn't come back. I don't know what happened later on. Optic disc edema, atrophy, macular edema, intraretinal hemorrhages, gliotic scars, whitish retinal infiltrate, serous macular detachment, drusen, epiretinal membrane, and macular hole have been described in these cases. Diagnosis is clinical, but uh, electroencephalography and increased measles antibodies in plasma and CFSF are diagnostic, as well as panencephalitis and brain, brain biopsy. But we have to differentiate cases from necrotizing other necrotizing retinitis cases, AMP, toxoplasmosis, hereditary retinal dystrophies. Treatment is with isoprenosine and intravitreal ventricular interferon alpha have also been described. This 11-year-old boy came with the diagnosis with uh, the complaint of blurred vision for the last weeks. 
patient was seeing 0.5 in the right eye and 0.8 in the right in the left eye. The fundus autofluorescence findings and especially the OCT findings uh, let us think about SSP and went went to a neurology consultation, which resulted in the definitive diagnosis. After two years, we see atrophy at the macular area, and the patient is still alive, but cerebral signs have progressed. Ocular tuberculosis causes 1% to 2% of ocular involvement and as a primary ocular tuberculosis or secondary ocular tuberculosis with hematogenous dissemination. The youngest patient in the literature is three months old. It mostly causes disseminated choroiditis, disc edema, hemorrhages, vitreitis, granulomatous anterior uveitis, subretinal abscess, retinal vasculitis, and panophthalmitis, and serpiginous like choroiditis have all been described. Differential diagnosis we have to rule out retinoblastoma and sarcoidosis in, sarcoidosis in certain cases, and Dr. Suda has given more beautiful examples. Diagnosis is difficult. PPD positivity shows exposure to mycobacterium tuberculosis, but not always active disease, and it is not significant in areas with BCG vaccine. Interferon gamma release assay positivity helps us a lot, chest X-ray as well, but analysis of intraocular fluids, PCR or tissue biopsy are the definitive diagnosis. This study has been already reviewed. Posterior uveitis are the main is the main finding in pediatric cases with choroidal involvement and optic disc edema and macular edema were higher in children than compared to adults. Again, a study from North India in 42 children with tuberculous uveitis, posterior uveitis was the main finding and the children have more ocular information, inflammation than compared to adults. Therefore, early additional immunosuppressive therapy may be necessary. Scratch disease is, can be seen in children less than 10 years old. Neuroretinitis and macular star are the main characteristic findings. Turkey, Dr. Tugal Tutkun and Associates have, uh, evaluated their cases in 10 years, and there were half of the cases were in pediatric age group. Infectious cases of neuroretinitis and also non-infectious cases should be ruled out, and the treatment is with antibiotics. Vokoyanagi Haruda syndrome is rare in children, but we may see. We may again have prodromal, uveitic, convalescent, or chronic recurrent phases. They may come with in these stages. We do the diagnosis with exam, fluorescein angiography, OCT, especially edu OCT and ICGA help us a lot. And diagnostic criteria have been previously published uh, 20 years ago, and last year the, the early stage and late stage classification criteria was published. Long term findings are summarized in recent two publications. One is from Saudi Arabia of 76 eyes, there were 21 acute and 17 chronic recurrent cases, when complications were more in chronic recurrent cases, as you may, you may uh, know. And in the second group in, from Asian Indian population, again 72 eyes, exudative retinal detachment was seen in 61% and sunset glow fundus in 12%, and complications were seen in more than half of the patients. Treatment is composed of corticosteroids and immune modulatory treatment and treatment of complications. We have seen this case in uh, 2005, 13-year-old female. She had uh, taken topical corticosteroids for bilateral uveitis at another center nine months ago. The visual acuities were 0.9 in, the, in both eyes. We see granularity pigment epithelial changes in the back of the eye with sunset glow fundus and peripapillary chore uh, probably choroidal neovascularization with hemorrhage in the right eye. When we look at the periphery, we see typical findings of a uh, convalescent face. And with fluorescein angiography, we don't see any uh, specific activation. We see only that staining. <laughs> 
Six months later, she presented with decreased vision in the left eye to 0.2 with a macular choroidal neovascularization. She was also myopic and also uh, had VK. We, did, we have done photodynamic therapy at the, that time, uh, two times with three months apart. And five years later, she retained her vision. But later on, she developed chronic anterior granulomatous type of uveitis, which necessitated first adesiopirin, then uh, adalimumab use. You see, choroidal I'm thickness is decreased. White dot syndromes are very rare. Uh, okay, Vishal, I'm just Thank you. calling that. White dots are very rare in children. Very reported. We don't see. We may see this typical case, but nowadays it's uh, mentioned as mutes. Mutes like reaction after urethral insults. We may see them in this disease or in toxoplasmosis. Those are also rare in children, but we may see in adolescents. So this frequently we see pediatric posterior uveitis when compared to adults, but complications are more. They need more aggressive treatment with multidisciplinary approach. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sibel, for showing all the beautiful images. And with this, now we move on to Lucia Soprin, and Lucia is going to tell us about systemic disorders and pediatric uveitis. Over to you, Lucia. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and to the organizers for putting together this series. I have no financial disclosures. So I'm gonna talk about diseases with systemic features that are important not to miss, but I will concentrate mo mostly on genetic conditions that are associated with uveitis and sarcoidosis. I will very briefly touch on Bechet's or infectious causes uh, because these have already been well covered. This will be a case-based presentation where I will show a case to illustrate the features and then talk briefly about each disorder. So the first case is a nine month old girl and she presents for an eye exam. Her past medical history has some very unique features. She has a full body birth, recurrent fevers, arthritis, and she also has some kind of CMS inflammatory process with developmental delay. She fixes and follows her anterior segment exam as normal, but she does have mild vitritis in both eyes. And these pictures taken with the RET cam and an examination un under anesthesia show optic nerve hyperemia, as well as some perivascular uh, fibrosis and exudates, which are most prominent in the right eye nasally. On the angiogram, you can see that both discs leak and that she has peripheral deep leakage diffusely. This patient, given the uh, constellation on review of systems of those unique findings, uh, was sent for genetic testing and had a mutation in a gene called NLRP3. This uh, mutation is associated with systemic diagnosis called neonatal onset multisystem inflammatory disease or NOMID. And this is an important disease to identify because it has a very specific treatment to it. And that is IL-1 um, antagonists work well for this. And in this patient's case, she was started on Kinneret or Anakinra uh, with daily subcutaneous injections and did quite well. So NOMID is part of a larger group of diseases uh, that are called cryoporin associated autoinflammatory syndromes. They are rare genetic disorders that are autosomal dominant in, in inheritance and caused by mutations in the NLRP3 gene. This leads to upregulation of cryoporin and then overproduction of pro-inflammatory IL-1 beta, hence the use of IL-1 blockers to treat this condition. And the fevers, uh, the Symptoms to think about in these patients are recurrent fevers and rashes, arthritis, myalgias, also abdominal pain in a very early age of the patient since birth many times. Um, it may mimic recurrent infections, but in this case, the infectious workup should be negative. There's a spectrum of diseases uh, that can be seen in CAPS and these are listed here in order of severity. So the least severe is the familial cold autoinflammatory syndrome, then muckle wells, and then what I presented, which is NOMID, which is the more severe form that can be associated with CNS inflammation, which is often the worst part of the disease. And so I have here a picture of an infant with the typical maculopapular rash. The arthritis is uh, 
unique in that it causes bony overgrowth and these children often have these very distorted joints early on in life. And the CNS inflammation, as I alluded to, can uh, lead to varying degrees of permanent damage, uh, including mental disability. And so it's very important to identify and treat these patients early, uh, given the very severe prognosis. The next case is a 15 year old boy with progressive bilateral vision loss. When he was seven years old, uh, he had relapsing fevers and severe fatigue. And then at age 10, he was diagnosed with bilateral optic nerve edema and posterior uveitis for which a workup was negative. Now there are various unique findings on his review of systems. in the permanent teeth. He also lacked tooth enamel and he did not sweat no matter how hot it got. He did not sweat, that's anhydrosis. By the time he got to us, his vision was quite poor in both eyes. His anterior segment was normal, but he had two plus vitreous cell. And you can see in these fundus photographs that he had optic nerve edema, as well as diffuse RP changes throughout the fundus. The autofluorescence shows the extent of the damage by the inflammation with multiple areas of hypoautofluorescence. And the FA shows diffuse leakage throughout the periphery, including uh, disc leakage. That's quite prominent. You'll notice here on the OCT, you know, there's chronic inflammation with vitritis. You'll notice that the edema is more pronounced nasally because of the optic nerve edema being a prominent finding in this syndrome. So we thought about autoinflammatory diseases, including uh, things that we've talked about already in NOMID, and he had testing for that, but it was all negative. So we sent him for whole exome sequencing, and he was found to have a mutation in an ALK-P1 gene. This is a very recently described uh, syndrome called Rosa syndrome. It was described in 2019, but since it's been described, we have seen an increasing number of patients in our clinic who fit into this uh, syndrome. So it's retinal dystrophy and optic nerve edema. You notice uveitis is not here, but they often have mild uh, chronic uveitis. And these patients have been referred to me by our neuroophthalmology colleagues because they present with optic nerve edema, they see some vitritis, and then they come to us. Remember the other SAH of Rosa, splenomegaly, anhydrosis, and headache, uh, in particular, the anhydrosis is a very uh, sensitive sign for this. So besides this patient that I presented in detail, I have since in the last uh, three years had two other families present to me. And I, these photos are just to emphasize that the primary uh, presentation is optic nerve edema with mild uveitis. And both of these uh, children, uh, they have an extensive family history documented now with autosomal dominant recessive, recessive nature and uh, mutation on genetic testing to confirm them. The original uh, description of the syndrome was in 15 patients from five unrelated families across the world. And the, uh, it is notable, they all had the same mutation. And I have already emphasized the clinical phenotype, which is optic nerve edema starting young, then chronic low-grade inflammation. And it's important to identify these patients because they do get progressive visual impairment. For example, one of the parents of one of the patients that I treat now has gone to no light perception in both eyes. Um, by the time he was about 40 years old. So important to think about this um, in a review of systems, asking about dental abnormalities, asking about anhydrosis, and uh, also these other uh, features listed here, splenomegaly and renal impairment. We don't know what this gene does uh, yet, but it's interesting that it's highly expressed in the RPE photoreceptors and in sweat glands. And we think it may have a role in cilia formation, cell polarity, and cell cycle regulation. We also don't know what the best treatment is for these patients um, because we've just recently described it and um, we're typically uh, seeing that they respond to steroids in the short term and we've tried several medications in these patients with varying degrees of success. So, so this remains to be known what is the best treatment for this group. The last genetic dis um, uh, disorder is in a 15 year old girl who was uh, referred for a uveitis evaluation. At age four, she had bilateral ankle arthritis and uveitis and then developed a rash, which was mild and not biopsied. The family history is very important in that her mother and older brother both have childhood onset arthritis. She came to us with poor vision in her right eye and elevated pressures in both eyes. And here on these anterior segment exam, exam photographs, you'll see 
uh, chorotic precipitates. There were some iris nodules that are difficult to visualize and uh, AC cell and posterior synechiae. And unfortunately, her fundus exam already shows glaucoma at this young age. So given her history, uh, we uh, did genetic testing and found a mutation in NOD2 CARD15. Uh, later on, uh, after her genetic diagnosis, um, uh, she also at some point had biopsy of the submandibular lymph nodes showed granulomatous changes. And uh, she has gone through many treatments and it's, as is often the case in these genetic uh, causes of autoinflammatory disease, treatment is uh, quite difficult to get inflammation under control, uh, but is currently controlled uh, on infliximab after desensitization. So this is Blau syndrome, also known as JAB syndrome, autosomal dominant, demonstrated in our patient by the family history and her mother and her uh, brother. And then the classic triad, uh, which I tried to highlight, was cutaneous involvement, polyarticular, polyarticular synovitis, and uveitis. However, it's important to know that there are other systemic manifestations as this condition has been further described in the literature. Patients can also have liver, kidney, and CNS involvement. The tip-off about blau jab syndrome is that the onset is very young, typically less than five years old, with a median onset of 26 months old. And the workup for things like JIA and spondyloarthropathy, uh, spondyloarthropathies with ANA and B27 is negative. The rash is often the first clinical sign and can be very asymptomatic, but when biopsy shows granulomas, the arthritis is usually polyarticular. And the ocular inflammation can be anywhere in the eye from the front to the back, but often the ocular findings are not the presenting symptom and therefore can go undiagnosed for a while, leading to visual impairment. This gene that's involved in uh, this disease is known uh, to lead to independent activation of NF-kappa B. And all of the mutations in this gene confer up to a fourfold increase in activation compared to the wild type. And I've listed here the two most common mutations. So we know how this disease works on a molecular level. We manage it, however, um, to, similar to other forms of non-infectious pediatric uveitis with corticosteroids, methotrexate, and TNF inhibitors being what's usually used. Interestingly, a group in Japan uh, reported on two patients with Blau syndrome who were treated with thalidomide. Thalidomide specifically downregulates NF-kappa B, uh, therefore could be a more targeted treatment uh, for these patients. In a segue to sarcoidosis, it's important to know that this entity that you may see in the literature called early onset sarcoidosis has the same symptoms and actually the same genetic cause as blau jabs. But early onset sarcoidosis is caused, caused by de novo mutations and occur sporadically, i.e. the patient has no family history of the disease. That is the distinguishing feature. And there is now a term of juvenile systemic granulomatosis, which includes both blau jabs and early onset sarcoidosis. In this early onset sarcoidosis, phenotype, as opposed to the more common variety of sarcoidosis that we see in adults, pulmonary involvement and adenopathy are much less common. But children also get the adult type of sarcoidosis. This typically presents later in childhood uh, with more visceral symptoms. And I'll show a case of this. This was an 11-year-old girl with bilateral eye redness. Uh, her review of systems showed that her systemic symptom was actually lower extremity weakness and lower back pain. Her vision was preserved still. She had signs of anterior inflammation in both eyes, including iris nodules to suggest granulomatous disease. And she had very extensive posterior segment involvement with perivascular exit dates uh, diffusely as well as intraretinal hemorrhages diffusely in both eyes. She had optic nerve leakage, retinal vascular leakage, as well as some areas of non-perfusion in the periphery. Her workup actually showed a normal ACE and lysozyme and quantiferon was negative, but the diagnosis came on imaging. So she had diffuse lymphadenopathy and she also had lacrimal larging, uh, gland enlargement. And in her spine, to account for her systemic symptoms, she had an expansile lesion in her spinal cord. She underwent lacrimal gland biopsy that confirmed the diagnosis of sarcoidosis and so this patient had neurosarcoidosis with panuveitis and retinal vasculitis. She was treated successfully with steroids, mycophenolate, infliximab, and laser to the areas of non-perfusion 
So my notes about sarcoidosis in children is that children with sarcoidosis are more likely to have peripheral lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, um, than adults with sarcoidosis. It's also very important to note that serum ACE values are unusually high in normal children compared to normal adults. So an, an elevated ACE is not as reliable in pediatric patients as it is in adult patients as an indication of sarcoidosis. Uh, I will briefly talk about Bichette's disease because this has already been covered. Um, this is a classic patient with mouth ulcers since age of 10, now presenting with uh, decreased vision and with a family history of mouth ulcers as well. He had decreased vision with a hypopion, blurred uh, view to the back with extensive vitritis in the right eye, diffuse leakage in the right eye after uh, initial treatment allowing a view for the FA, mouth ulcers and skin changes. So this was Bechette's disease. This has already been covered by other speakers in the session. So I will just highlight a couple of differences. Children with Bechette's disease are more likely to have neurological involvement, gastrointestinal involvement. And as, as in our patient who uh, has a strong family history of mouth ulcers, a family history of Bechette's disease. And ocular involvement is actually less common in children and in adults. And there's a longer period between the onset of the first symptoms of Bechette's and development of the complete disease in children compared to adults. Uh, the last case that I'll show is a 15 year old girl with headaches and floaters who had already been evaluated by neurology for headaches and had an MRI that showed some non-enhancing lesions. Visions were 2050 and 2040. She had very mild anterior chamber cell, but more prominently in the posterior segment, she had Paris plana exudates inferiorly, a localized serous detachment in the right eye, and diffuse leakage on the angiogram. We treated her with uh, bilateral periocular steroid injections, and on follow-up MRI, it showed progression of her demyelinating lesions, and she was diagnosed with MS and started on mycophenolate. And the pearl here for multiple sclerosis-associated uveitis, in this case intermediate uveitis, is that the childhood onset of the disease is associated with a higher frequency of relapses compared to adults. And so they need more aggressive treatment in general, uh, not only for their uveitis, but also for their CNS disease. Very briefly, uh, infectious uveitis has already been covered. Remember that some kinds of infectious uveitis can have systemic symptoms, in particular, primary acquired toxoplasmosis, TB, Lyme, and Bartonella. Uh, similar cases have already been shown, but here are children who all had systemic syndromes and symptoms along with their eye findings. Uh, in one case, Bartonella IgM positive with high fevers leading to Bartonella neuroretinitis, I, Lyme IgM positivity with a rash leading to a diagnosis of Lyme choroiditis with a temporal subretinal fluid in this photograph and a 14 year old girl with fever malaise and lymphadenopathy being toxo IgM positive leading to diagnosis of toxoplasmosis. So in summary, consider genetic causes, especially in patients presenting very early in childhood with uveitis and systemic symptoms that are suggestive of one of the autoinflammatory uh, conditions, particularly rash, recurrent fevers, and arthritis. Recognize that ROSA is a relatively newly described syndrome to be aware of, especially in the setting of prominent optic nerve swelling. Sarcoidosis in childhood presents with more systemic symptoms and visceral involvement than what we see in adults. And don't forget to evaluate for infectious causes of uveitis in children with systemic symptoms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucia. I mean, you really have taught us a lot and I'm sure we are going to look for uh, quite a few of these systemic associations, which actually, honestly, we were not really looking for earlier. Thank you, Lucia. And with this, we come to the last talk of the session, but the most important one, I guess, because we do have a big challenge in managing these patients when we diagnose that. So we have with us Sheila Angelis Han, and she's going to talk to us about drugs in pediatric uveitis. Over to you, Sheila. Good morning, everybody, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak to you all about a drug use in a pediatric uveitis. 
So today I'm going to talk not only about the conventional and non-conventional treatment of UBIs, but we'll also talk about the different side effects, how we monitor for medication-related toxicity. We'll also talk about factors that have been associated with the remission and relapse after we discontinue therapy. So I think briefly, you know, we've had such a nice review about all the systemic diseases that can be associated with uveitis. I just wanted a brief uh, overview of some questions that you can ask in clinic to help you uh, determine which systemic disease a child may potentially have. And as all these speakers have all shown, the location of the uveitis can be associated with different systemic diseases, but also knowing that the location can change. And a lot of times we need various labs and imaging to help us determine whether or not systemic disease is associated. But we know that for anterior uveitis, you can have GIA, tinu, different HLB27 associated diseases, such as spondyloarthropathies, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis. And for posterior and panuveitis, you consider other systemic symptoms, conditions, just Bechet's, sarcoid, Blau, and BKH. Other uh, autoimmune diseases like lupus, GPA, Kawasaki, and Sjogren's can also be associated with uveitis, but we tend to see this less uh, commonly in children, especially because they're often treated for the systemic conditions um, concurrently. When you evaluate children, I think for the ocular symptoms, it's especially important in JIA. As we know, children with JIA tend to have asymptomatic uveitis, or those with HLA may be symptomatic um, unilaterally. Symptoms that are important to ask are you know, fever, fatigue, weight loss, and rash, um, arthritis for GIA, oral or genital ulcerations for Bechet's, rectal ulcers or diarrhea, or blood and stool for inflammatory bowel disease, um, respiratory or lymphadenopathy for sarcoidosis, and renal symptoms, especially with lab findings in children who have tinnitus, since many of them can be asymptomatic from a systemic standpoint. Then I'm going to go to the meat of the um, discussion, which is treatment strategies and how do we tr treat children with uveitis? How do you know it's time to start systemic treatment? Or which treatments do you decide to use? I think we all agree that the goals of systemic treatment is that we want to achieve sustained remission. We want to preserve a child's vision, and we really want there not to be any, any ocular inflammation. We also want to minimize the use of glucocorticoids since they can lead to a long-term damage. The other goal is that we want to make sure when we are on treatment, we're preventing recurrences, new or worsening complications. But it's important to bear in mind that a lot of the treatments that we decide to use are based on expert opinion, retrospective studies, and international guidelines, knowing that there have really only been two RCTs in adalimumab and in tocilizumab. I just wanted to show you this armamentum of various medications that are used to treat children with uveitis. And we all know most of them start off with glucocorticoids, either locally or systemic. For children who end up failing glucocorticoids, there are different non-biologic DMARDs, um, especially initially. You can use DMARDs and biologic therapy for those who have complications at onset. And afterwards, you can add TNF or other non-TNF biologics. But we all also know that the medications that you choose are based on the availability um, in your area. So when I think about when to start systemic treatment in the children that are sent to me in consult, I like to ask about what are the things that have been important to keep the uveitis controlled? So we know that glucocorticoids should not be used for long periods of time. So I like to ask, you know, what type of steroids have been needed? Do they need to use topical drops? Was it prednisolone acetate, durazol? How frequent are they using it? Is it more than you know, three times a day? Have they been on oral corticosteroids for more than a few weeks? Um, and then whether or not they're actually able to taper their medications. So a family comes to me and says, you know, we've been on topical corticosteroids, but every time we try to taper, we have a flare in the uveitis. Or they may tell me we're never able to taper off of it. And the other thing I like to think about is whether or not they need other topical medications. So are they on glaucoma medication drops orally to, as secondary to the use of persistent glucocorticoids to control uveitis? So even if a child, for example, is on topical glucocorticoids for less than three drops a day, if they're needing glaucoma drops, then that tells me that you probably need to start systemic treatment. I want to share with you the 2019 um, guidelines for the screening, monitoring, and treatment of children with JIA-associated uveitis. And I think that's this is important. All the most studies have been conducted in children with uveitis that's associated with JIA. Many of these 
recommendations are also very applicable to uh, uveitis of other types. And this was nice because it consisted of individuals who were rheumatologists. We had Dr. Anita Sin and Gary Holland as our ophthalmology experts. We had patients, parents, a lit review team, and a great expert. And, and this is what I think about when we start um, systemic treatment. For those on topical glucocorticoids, if they continue to have a glucocorticoid requirement for more than three months, we like to start systemic treatment, or if they continue to use oral steroids as bridging therapy. So if they have this continued uh, glucocorticoid requirement, we like to start them on systemic therapy. If they've actually been on their systemic treatment for three months or more, and they continue to require glucocorticoids, we also like to change or escalate the treatment that they've been on. And the next question after you decide to start is, which systemic treatment do you actually decide to initiate? We have our traditional first-line agents, and methotrexate is our typical first-line agent, especially in children who have uncomplicated or non-severe uveitis at initial um, presentation. Although the methotrexate can be given both as oral or subcutaneous um, injections, I tend to prefer subcutaneous injections you know, primarily because of the bioavailability and the decrease um, of the gastrointestinal side effects like nausea and vomiting. For children who come to me with some form of vision impairment or who have ocular complications at onset, I like to do combination therapy of methotrexate and either adalimumab or infliximab. For children who start methotrexate alone, then we start adding um, the TNF inhibitors. And then there are different third line agents um, that we'll talk about later. Due to the, the audience and knowing that a lot of these biologics are not necessarily available, um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on methotrexate. And uh, my friend Gabriel Simonini had uh, published a meta-analysis previously and he showed that in children on methotrexate, you know, about 50% of them will fail despite it being our first line agent. And subsequent studies after have shown that anywhere from 50 to 70% of children will fail methotrexate. You know, importantly, um, Dr. Fulberry had shown that it takes a mean of four months for there to be any efficacy and anywhere from one to 12 months to actually determine whether or not methotrexate is um, efficient for uveitis, which I think is important because during this period of continued glucocorticoid use or inflammation, aquavular complications do accrue. Um, another study by Dr. Waring has shown that high-dose methotrexate um, is associated with shorter time to remission, so we do like to use higher doses um, early on. And this, uh, these findings were nicely shown in the CARA registry, which is the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Alliance, which consists of pediatric rheumatologists within North America. And in this registry, we show that of 92 children, half of them failed um, DMARD use and required biologics. So again, supporting uh, the earlier studies on the use of methotrexate. And the next um, agent that we like to use uh, are infliximab or adalimumab. And um, earlier studies have shown that both have been you know, rare, uh, relatively effective for uveitis, maybe lower for infliximab, but I think a lot of the previous studies um, had differences in the dose of infliximab given and the frequency of involvement. So these studies have been anywhere from five to 10 milligrams per kilo per dose every four to eight weeks, I think due to the availability in, in different locations. Um, and a, a lot of us uh, tend to use adalimumab in the beginning. Um, and we are all very familiar with Dr. Ramanan's study, um, which was an RCT on adalimumab, which showed its superiority uh, when you use adalimumab and methotrexate versus placebo alone. I wanna share with you um, treatment plans that were uh, determined by the CARA group again. And this again included Dr. Holland and Nita Sen. And what we do is, you know, you either start with a trexate PO or subcutaneous, but again, knowing that there is a um, preference for subcutaneous, a max of 30 milligrams. So this is what we often will start off with unless you have complications at the beginning. And then we move on to TNF therapy, either adalimumab or infliximab. And depending if one works or you fails, you can go from one to the other, or you can decide to escalate the dose. If your conventional treatments are failing, there are some strategies that you can use. So combination therapy is important. And I think that increasing the dose or frequency, a lot of us know about the 
importance of bridging the blood ocular barrier and the gene privilege of the eye. So I think that increasing the dose of frequency for children with uveitis is important. So in our practice, we use adalimab as uh, frequently as 40 milligrams weekly. We have given infliximab anywhere from 10 to 20 milligrams per kilo per dose every four weeks. I personally use up to 50 milligrams per kilo per dose every four weeks. If there is some response and you still think that it's not as effective as you would need it to be, you can change the DMAR. So try CELSEP or loponamide, depending on what's available. I always recommend checking for drug antibodies. Um, if you have HACPAs, that could be an indication of why your treatment is failing and you move on to other treatment. If you're failing because methotrexate, uh, because of methotrexate intolerance, I try to optimize use of folic acid by increasing the dose and the anti-nausea medications. One other medicine that I think about using if I've had some response to the traditional TNFs is golimumab. And a study um, recently, 2021, by Dr. Lance has shown that in children who'd had a response to add lumimab, a complete response, but for some reason started failing, when they switched to golimumab, uh, it seemed to be more effective for those children um, as opposed to children who did not have an initial response to adalimumab. So I think that golimumab is another uh, medication that you consider if your traditional therapies fail. When those are failing, some other strategy you can do is to change the DMARD, or if you're having um, difficulty getting another biologic, adding another biologic, adding another non-biologic DMARD. So some studies have shown the use of microphenolate, azathioprine, lovonavide, and cyclosporin. I'm a little more cautious with cyclosporin due to the many side effects. And then for the other biologics, you know, there are there have been RCTs and tocilizumab, but really to know which of the next medication to use um, is probably due through experience. And I also like to think about the underlying systemic disease that a child has. So the only other RCT in tocilizumab is again uh, done by Dr. Ramanan, and they looked at tocilizumab sub two every two to three weeks. And all the, the primary endpoint of the trial wasn't met. I think what's important to remember is that there was complete resolution of macular edema in three fourths of these patients. So tocilizumab can be an important uh, biologic to consider in children who fail at initial therapy. The, the mode of administration is also important. I know that the RCT was focused on subcutaneous administration, but Dr. Kasada Masak showed in 2017 that in children who had an initial response to tocilizumab IV, when they switched to subcutaneous uh, form of tocilizumab, the, most of the children had a relapse. So perhaps the mode of administration is also important in the medications that we use. And the new condom on the block is, are the JAK inhibitors. Um, JAK inhibitors in rheumatology have, have really been important in many of our diseases. And uh, we have used JAK inhibitors in some of our children. And this study by Dr. Mizrachi showed that TOFA and baricitinib have both been um, successful in, uh, in treating their children with a JA-associated uveitis. But you know, more to come, Dr. Ramanan, Ramanan also has another RCT in progress looking specifically at baricitinib. So some strategies that I use to help decide what to initiate for treatment after a methotrexate and TNF are failed, I think about, you know, what is effective for the systemic disease. So if a child has JIA, I use biologics that have approved for JIA. For those that don't have JIA-associated uveitis, for example, they should, so I might try azathioprine. If a child has idiopathic CAU, I treat very similarly to JIA. Other things I think about are the findings of examination. So for children who have cystoid macular edema, my next step would be tocilizumab. Um, I ought to use tocilizumab by IV at higher doses. And I always try to remind myself to consider the patient, the patient and family preference. So some children, especially are young, um, don't like the injections. They prefer a monthly infusions. Uh, School-age children may not like the infusions because it's disrupted the school, so they prefer injections at home. Uh, so I think those are some things to consider, but ultimately you know, it really also depends on the availability of, what's, of what you have. So you should optimize the treatment that you have available to you. The other thing I wanted to mention are the different uh, side effects. So these are the general side effects that are associated with these biologics. So we think about immunosuppression, so there's an increased risk for infection. Uh, we worry about medication-related toxicities, the panorenal toxicity, lipid profile. So lab monitoring is very important in these children. Uh, some of them can have injection site or infusion reactions. 
there is the risk of a reduced efficacy over time, especially with our TNF uh, treatments. So I always uh, think about checking for the antibodies if these children start to fail therapy. And I think it's really important that they use concomitant DMARDs uh, simultaneously. Um, screening for tuberculosis is important always in the beginning. There is some discussion about whether or not you can drug induce lupus or malignancy with the traditional TNFs. And for these children, uh, they should not be receiving live vaccines if they are on biologics. I'm going to briefly talk about you know, monitoring of medication related toxicity. Um, and I'm going to share these are hot off the press. These are the new ACR guidelines that talk about medication monitoring and immunizations in children with GIA. But since the treatments are similar, I think they're applicable to our uveitic patients as well. So I think you know, one of the really important roles of our ophthalmology colleagues is to encourage lab monitoring, especially in children who have idiopathic uveitis. A lot of times the children with idiopathic uveitis see us a lot less frequently. Uh, so just encouraging to get their labs monitored is really important. So prior to initiation of systemic treatment, we do baseline lab monitoring, you know, CBC, LFT, check the renal function and lipid profile for tofacitinib and antocilizumab. We do TB screening prior to biologic treatment. And then the monitoring really depend on the medication. So for most of them, we, you know, we do check them every three to four months, except for adalimumab and infliximab, which you can do, the ACR recommends annually. Some people will do it every six months. It really depends on the comfort of, of the patients as well. Um, if there are abnormalities in your labs, you, some things we consider doing is decreasing the dosage of the medication, um, increasing the interval between the dose that when it's given, withholding or perhaps discontinuing the medication as well. If we're making a change to the dose or there isn't a lab abnormality, I'll check their labs even much sooner. So, so this is a nice table from um, the guidelines I showed you earlier, just to show the different frequencies of checking the lab monitoring, depending on the medication. So methotrexate, metocilizumab, tofacitinib, um, TNF, you know, the baseline monitoring and how frequently you check them after. And the final um, talk will be focused on, you know, what is the optimal duration of treatment and what is the risk of relapse after medication discontinuation? I think it's important because we need to know how long do we actually start, how long do we actually treat these children and when should we consider tapering? So we know that in children on medication, when you attempt to taper or you actually discontinue treatment, most of them, 90% will flare in two years and anywhere from 40 to 70% will flare within the first year. So this is really significant. So a lot of the studies have shown that some of the factors associated with remission are starting medication early, controlling the disease early and treating them for a longer period of time. Some studies show three years, but you know, really the question is, are we able to discontinue treatment, especially since so many of them flare early? Um, and the longer you have inactive uveitis, the higher a chance of remission later. And, you know, there was another study that, that talked about perhaps the uveitis diagnosis is also uh, playing a factor into whether or not you'll achieve remission later. And this uh, was a nice study by Dr. Simonini where he looked at 94 children with various types of uveitis who were on methotrexate, adalimumab, and infliximab. And what he showed is that at 49 months of follow-up, only 18% of children with uveitis that was associated with GIA were in remission. They also showed that for those who achieved remission sooner within the first six months of starting um, with treatment, they had a higher chance of, of being on medication-free remission later. So some things to consider is the type of disease. It seems like children who have uveitis associated with GIA have an increased risk of relapse. And then, you know, really important is early control of disease, so early detection and early treatment. We don't know a lot, but I think most of you are aware of Dr. Acharya's study, the ADJUST trial, which is a stopping trial of adalimumab in children with uveitis associated with JIA. So hopefully more answers to come then. Uh, you know, there are many different recommendations that have come out internationally, not only from North America, but from the UK, from Europe, um, you know, from New Zealand and, and, and everywhere else. So I think these could be important to look at as well. And finally, I just want to highlight really the importance of collaboration amongst ophthalmologists and rheumatologists to improve our vision outcomes. Uh, we like to get our pediatric subspecialists involved. You know, for example, if they have tinu, we like to have nephrology involved. 
or IBD or to have the gastroenterologist involved, but this collaboration is, is so critical uh, to these children's outcomes. So I think, you know, the take home points that I wanted to make today is, you know, timely optimal management is super important. We want to start systemic treatment early so we have better outcomes. You know, children, we typically started methotrexate and it can be effective, but most of these children, at least half will end up needing a biologic. I would consider a biologic as first line agent in children who present with severe uveitis at onset. I often will need to use higher dosing. I think it probably has to do with having to bridge that barrier, but we clearly need more RCTs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila, for beautifully explaining how to go about treating these kids. So we do have Manfred now uh, for a few controversies that we can take. Over to you, Manfred. Oh. First, <clears throat> thanks to all participants, all the faculty members. Great presentations. A lot of information, I'm sure, about this one. Uh, for all the participants, I think I missed to tell you at the beginning <clears throat> that you can get all these informations also from the previous workshops on demand on the same uh, website where you registered. If you scroll down there, you will find all the previous 14 webinars and the 15th, I think, will be there on Tuesday, something like that. And some... Um, some presentations were really filled with super actual information, and I think it's worse to check these things again a little bit later. Well, we have a few minutes only for a controversy, and I would like to concentrate for actually only two points. The one is I would like to ask you <coughs> about differences between adult disease, classical adult uveitis types, and uh, the same type of uveitis in kids. Um, what do you think what is different in Bechet's disease? So Sybil, for example, I think for Bechet, you have the most, imp the most uh, experience. Are you doing a pathology test? Is it as worse as in adults or don't you use it anymore? That was one of the questions actually also from the participants. Yeah, one of the participants has asked about a pathology test. It's done like mm -hmm. in adults. And our pediatric department does uh, it uh, nearly in all cases. It's also used, but mm -hmm. it's not mandatory. A negative pathology test can also be seen in patients with Bechet's disease. So negativity doesn't would rule you, out Bechet. Would you think and, it's less important in kids than in adults? Well, I don't. It's only one difference. of the criteria. Uh huh. Uh, in consensus criteria, it's one of the criteria. Mm -hmm. It's, it's okay. similar importance. Similar and then uh, with the visual uh, findings, with the clinical uh, ophthalmologic findings are similar to that in adults. We see more uh, family history in children than compared mm -hmm. to adults. Mm -hmm. So there may be a genetic background, genetic susceptibility as well. And the treatment is similar to adults. And response case. to treatments is a similar one. Yes. Wonderful. But sometimes we see um, <coughs> more severe cases in children too. Mm -hmm. so, so, so in children, uveitis doesn't have a milder cause like this one I have uh, shown. Mm -hmm. What about in other diseases? Any uh, any comment, for example, to intermediate uveitis between, let's say, adults, eighteen and a little bit older, and kids? What is your experience? Are there differences in the cause of disease, in severity, something like that? Um, well, well I, I think what we, okay, you know, just go on, please. Maria? Yes, Maria. Uh, I, I think uh, there are some differences, but uh, uh, in, uh, uh, about uh, the systemic diseases that are associated in, in, a, in our casuistry, we found more uh, multiple sclerosis in adults than in children. Uh, also, yes. if we found three cases of MS in children, uh, one uh, concomitant, uh, and uh, in uh, other two cases, uh, uh, in one case, uh, the intermediate uveitis uh, 
was found uh, 10 years before the multiple sclerosis and the other one uh, 10 years after. Um, Mm, I think that in, in intermediate uveitis, that depends uh, on uh, the presentation. So uh, in childhood, uh, like in adults, uh, uh, in, uh, the onset is very important. Uh, in, uh, if uh, there is uh, a severe disease with cystoid macular edema, uh, the 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 course uh, is, uh, in, in, is is bad. Uh, so in adults, like in children. We also analyzed the association to systemic disease and found real association outside of Tino, definitely, uh, only for MS with the age of 18, something like this. And I think there are only a few people described, at least in Germany, where we looked a little bit more about this one, younger than, uh, let's say, 15 or 14. And also with sarcoidosis. For overall, in adults, we see that in intermediate uveitis, 10% have or had already <laughs> sarcoid, 10% with multiple sclerosis, but with begin of 18, something like that. I've seen patients which have intermediate uveitis since the age of seven, eight, nine. They develop multiple sclerosis with 18. So that's, I think, a very important thing for most of the participants. Uh, if you have patients with intermediate uveitis and you can follow them, even if there's a successful treatment of your uveitis, ask some questions about underlying diseases during the next, let's say, 10, 15 years when you mm -hmm. control them. Um, Stefan, comment to I this think one? It's an important, yeah, there's just one comment because um, multiple sclerosis as well as sarcoidosis in children are very rare diseases anyway. Yeah? So there the association to, a, to, to, to intermediate uveitis is very low. So um, I think it's just we, because... It's we see 10%, because, 10 to 15%. Yes, but in, but in children, these two diseases are very rare, oh, much rarer yes. than adults. Okay. It really makes a difference if you look at pediatric mm -hmm. intermediate uveitis mm -hmm. compared to mm -hmm. adult. Manfred, can I ask a question? Sure. Any experience of JAK inhibitors in children, especially no. Sheila and Lucia or anybody else? No. Well, I just have a single. I just have a single case, and she had um, um, tocilizumab, uh, uh, tocilizumab for um, for um, psoriatic arthritis. And um, she had she had received from her, from her a rheumatologist a TNF blocker before and everything was okay and then she she was switched to an uh, to an, uh, to an jack kinase inhibitor and suddenly she developed a severe uveitis which she hadn't had before so later on we put her back on 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 a TNF that's the only single observation I can supply you with. No, I'm talking mm -hmm. as a therapy in recalcitrant uveitis. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have time, we can probably come. Any other comments? Sorry. I've used uh, JAK inhibitors for a few patients with uveitis. It's, it's not my first line, but I've had good experience with it. And I know there's a chat question about whether or not uh, we've had some toxicities related with it. It's been well tolerated, not only my uveitis patients, but others with rheumatic conditions. I know that in adults, there is a concern with, you know, clotting and, and COVID. So I think uh, there's a little bit of concern with that for the adult patients. So. But you. Sheila, what type well, what of uveitis of patients did you treat? Sorry. I've what type both, of uveitis? I've used, it, I've used it for a JA-associated uveitis. JA, okay. JA, okay. That's important. One, uh, one question, uh, do you use um, similar doses as in adults or do you increase the dose in kids? For the JAK inhibitors, we've used yeah. the similar doses for them and it's been okay. Uh, you know, okay. so for the other medications, I really had to use much higher, but for the JAK inhibitors, they've done well. Okay. Uh, can I go quickly back to the original idea to compare the classical uveitis forms between adults and uh, kids? Uh, sympathetic of time, yeah. Any idea? Do you see any differences in these things between adults and kids. I think we don't have too many cases to compare that, but the few which are published do not seem to have a lot of differences. Something yeah. I'm, I, I, well, no, I didn't. No, no, Manfred, Manfred okay. I agree. Um, I agree. Um, um, at least the very limited experience I have is that they probably respond a little better to TNF blockers than adults, but this is just small numbers. Yeah. Probably somebody else has different experiences. 
Okay. I have the same experience. I have had a couple of kids and they've responded well as of my adults to both okay. anti-metabolites and TNF-alpha. I don't see a difference. But I think the treatment is the same. You will start with steroids because they're quickly effective and then switch quite quickly to a non-steroid treatment, yes. Would you avoid yeah. immunosuppression? No, I situation? think the, in children, no, I think the stakes are even higher with their long-term vision. Yeah. So I, I would simultaneously start uh, steroids and then already start the steroid sparing therapy. Yes, okay. definitely. Well, in, 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 for sympathetic ophthalmia, I completely agree. Okay. You have to start early with immunosuppression <clears throat> medication. Quick step to infectious uveitis. Uh, what about uh, diagnosis of TB? Is there a difference in the procedure between kids and adults? Uh, you know, TB is not so common in children. Like she showed one of the publications that we have published, but you know, honestly, it just constitutes 1% of the total uveitis patient <sighs> in children that we see. Oh, so it's not it's very common. In fact, we are now seeing blau more common than TB. And many patients which a decade earlier we had labeled as JIA, now that we are testing for not to and looking for it, uh, they are turning out to be not too positive. Uh, but TB, our testing generally remains the same. However, it's not easy to get the CT scan done so that has to be done under anesthesia. Mm. And I'm personally, you know, my pediatric rheumatologist is here in audience, Ankur Jindal. I'm chasing him to do PET scan in some of these children. But really, you know, we haven't been doing it as a routine. Would you say that you have more problems if you suggest this, if you think this is ocular TB and you do not find systemic TB, you think you have more problems to get them to a correct anti-TB treatment? No, no, we don't have because we have a wonderful coordination. Oh, so if we tell our to start ATT for any reasons, we do receive anti-TB mm. drugs. And secondly, in our population, now that biologics are being used, almost as first line for severe uveitis, uh, you know, we do add, they do add ATT many a times as a prophylaxis, even if the ocular disease, we are not suspecting mm -hmm. to be tuberculosis. Great. So one short comment from my side, I have hardly heard the word HSV from anyone. Amazing. <laughs> so I think the books are right that this really starts in kids with blepharitis, conjunctivitis, and later on, probably going on to keratitis and in adults then to uh, uveitis. Same with Fuchs. I think someone had a short uh, table. There was very, very few Fuchs in, but Fuchs definitely is not a children's disease. And this is, I think, remar remarkable, really. The final point I would like to go on is uh, these genetic uh, diseases. Um, Lucia, thanks so much to bring this to our notice. I think this is some of the future things, definitely. And we have to go more and more uh, in detail to these things. Uh, Maria mentioned that uh, Tino and Sarcoid, they have a lot of similarities. Well, in Tino, we know a little bit about this. Um, my question about sarcoid is Blau syndrome, sarcoid, the similarities have been, do we have enough information that sarcoid is not also has some kind of genetic background? So uh, we've actually looked at NOD2 mutations in patients with sarcoidosis and have not found anything. Uh, we have anything. a... Yeah, we have a paper published on that uh, yet, but obviously the sample size was on the order of 50 or 60 patients. So for, you know, we could be missing rare mutations. So I think in larger genetic data sets, it will be interesting to look at the NOD2 gene in more detail. I think so. Definitely. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> could you probably again summarize, Kit jump, comes into your office. When do you think about your genetic ocular disease? Very early onset, especially in you know, infancy or the first two to three years of life. Uh, arthritis and skin lesions, early onset in life. Those are the things that would tip me off. Uh, family history, of course. Mm, fever? 
fever for sure, recurrent fevers, both for the auto-inflammatory uh, diseases and um, the Rosa syndrome. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's remarkable, especially as you clearly pointed out, as long as IL-1 beta is involved, um, we have some good treatments for these things. Yes. We also saw yeah. a family with Michael Wells uh, syndrome, I think the largest, which has been ever published. And they're on treatment. They're doing fantastic. Yes. They had sometimes recurrences, two uveitis recurrences per, per month, and it's all gone under yeah. treatment. So that's a yeah. drawback. And the treatment is extremely expensive. So that's something the uh, health insurance normally pays, at least in Germany, fortunately, but the diagnostics is in our hands. So that's, I think, is something, and I strongly would recommend to everyone, if this was a little bit too quick, Lucia's talk with all these genetic things uh, to go back and to have a look for this one, probably to make a photo for these things to discuss, if you see a lot of uveitis patients, of course, and to discuss this probably also with people from your department, if they can help to establish some kind of genetic uh, well, participation of these people to help you in this regard. I think things get worse. We will see more and more of these associations and very important. I so this is very nice. We are now doing imaging a lot. We are looking at fluorescein leakage. And you know, so we are, becoming more aware of inflammation because uh, earlier we were honestly not doing so much for these children. So now we are able to characterize the phenotype which do not fit in the usual descriptions. So probably as Lucia said, I was highly motivated today to do a lot more gene testing than I currently am doing, yeah. And probably you should make it to an important point in the ISG to... Mm -hmm as an additional developing point, yes, to bring this to the information and to support that also. Yeah. Okay, I think we are 11 minutes over time. Uh, <clears throat> there's still one uh, and question, which you probably will, oh yes, Vishali, can you introduce that quickly? Okay, uh, so it's a proud privilege to announce our 10th International Symposium. <laughs> on uveitis, which will be held at Utrecht in the Netherlands between 25th and 27th August. We prefer, we would love to meet all of you in person because we have been meeting every month for last 15 months virtually. So I think it's time to go in person, but we do understand the constraints of the modern world we are living in. So we are going to have a hybrid format for this. And for some of our friends who are beginners in uveitis, there is a course, which is the basic uveitis course that will be on 26th and 27th. And we will be sending you this program. You could register for the entire meeting or for the uveitis course, if you are interested, only in the basic course. And of course, our lines for abstract submissions are opening soon on Monday. And we look forward to receiving great participation and wonderful abstracts from all of you. And we promise to send you the decision of our abstracts as soon as possible. We are aware of the May critical end. situation with uh, flights and so on and hotel bookings and uh, would be wonderful to meet you there. Yes. yes. And before that, we will meet again in a month. I think the next topic will be a, a little bit more theoretical about immunology of yeah. uveitis. Okay, so thank thanks to everyone. I hope you, you had some you. interesting two hours. Thanks so much for all the members of the faculty. I've learned, as always, a lot from you. And please have a lovely weekend. Bye. Thank Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So let's see the questions. Answered all of them. Answered. You answered all of them already. Everybody helped. Well, for this one, for the first one, pediatric skin and joint, I will tell, I will bring something in. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.
Thank you very much. Sorry for <clears throat> being a little bit late. Beautiful, your pictures were so beautiful. Thank you. Okay, Manfred, I will see you for the next. Bye. 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 Manfred Fernando has agreed to be, okay, we are still live, that's fine. I write this one here.